electric big rig that went off the freeway. This uh, collection of uh, Waymo vehicles caused a Tesla to catch fire during last week's hurricane. See? Did you know over 100,000 EVs will be out of service this year alone? And the top comment that I get is not that they catch on fire, is that the batteries will end up in a landfill. But here's what no one tells you. Over 95% of the important minerals in the battery, like lithium, nickel, and cobalt, are infinitely recyclable. I'm standing in the middle of the desert in Nevada where we have old EV batteries, old electronics, and they're all being sorted, getting ready to be recycled here at Redwood Materials. Today I'm taking you behind the scenes where only a handful of people have ever been granted access to. that are actually cut resistant Kevlar sleeves as part of the safety protocol to be able to enter this next area. Inside Redwood Materials, the brainchild of Tesla's co-founder JB Straubel. He left Tesla in 2019 when he realized our dependent tendency on these precious metals was bigger than just Tesla. All right, guys, one of the best nonprofits fighting for clean energy is holding their seventh annual EV raffle for the planet, and this year is their best yet. This year, every ticket gives you not one, but three chances to win a stunning EV, with proceeds supporting the work of Seacan Action Fund. This year, first place winners will choose from six luxury EV prizes, the Lucid Gravity or Air, the Rivian R1 SRT, or Porsche Macan EV or Taycan. The second prize winner can choose between the Hyundai i Ionic 5 or the VW ID Buzz van. And for the first time, a third place winner will get the Chevy Equinox EV. So again, three chances to win with each ticket and they're only selling 10,000 tickets, so your odds are better than ever. Plus, state and federal prize taxes are covered and all tariffs too. Tickets are just $200. Go to www.evraffle.org. That's evraffle.org. I'll link everything you need to know in the description below. And remember, when you use our links, you're also helping to support this channel. All right, let's get back to the video. You know all those Chromebooks that every student's using right now? Well, what happens when they're all done? Or when the newest cell phone comes out or gets a crack? What do you do with it? Or those power tools that just quit working? When I think about recycled paper, for example, I think about it losing some of its quality or maybe even some of its DNA as it goes through the processing. But what happens to the minerals in your electronics or even your EV batteries as it goes through recycling the battery is actually made of? The easiest way to think of it is like a sandwich with a few important layers. So lithium is really the star of the show. It's a super light metal that helps the battery hold and move energy. And it's also what makes the battery rechargeable. And then we have cobalt. This might be the most controversial metal, but this helps it stay stable and not overheat. Then there's nickel. This is another metal that helps the battery store more energy and last longer. Graphite, electrolyte, and some other bits like aluminum and copper. And again, this is just a simplified view of what a battery is. When you charge your phone or you go to charge your car, these metals help your battery fill up with energy and then they release it when you're using your phone or you go for a drive. In fact, the biggest lithium ion mine is probably in your junk drawer right now. And the vast majority of those 100,000 EVs or other lithium ion batteries that are retiring this year actually end up here at Redwood Materials. And that's how we go from this to this. And much of what you're seeing here actually came from EVs that were in the wildfires in Los Angeles and Maui or in Hurricane Helene. And because we're talking about damaged lithium ion batteries, you have to be extremely cautious when it comes to thermal management. That's what's called a FLIR, so forward-looking infrared camera. That has, in the many like it, are pointed all over this yard. I don't know if you've ever hung out with search and rescue people, but that's what they use to find like lost mm -hmm. hikers in the yeah. woods. And that'll tell when a pack or a module or a device somewhere is starting to heat up faster than we're comfortable with. Maybe it's heating up faster than the ambient temperature is heating up that day, and then we can have our team pull those, isolate those, dunk those if necessary. Um, and just like really keep something very small and easy to control from becoming something big and not easy to control. Mm -hmm. And just a couple miles away from here is where JB Straubel spearheaded Tesla's Gigafactory in 2014 and where he came to the realization that the battery supply chain for his EVs had to travel over 50,000 miles to end up in his American made vehicles. He also realized that these costly materials were infinitely recyclable and in 10 to 15 years they would be reaching the end of their life cycle. There's a very big difference between a blood glucose monitor and a thousand pound EV battery pack. So how do I how do I take this and render it down to a nice uniform valuable something 
that I can then do intelligent, valuable things to. And from here, it's almost like a recipe where you mix things like your old laptop and your old toothbrush to make the highest quality minerals for the next process. You know that your EV material is gonna have a lot more nickel than cobalt. You know that your consumer devices will have a much higher percentage of cobalt, let's say. And we wanna think of, I like to think of these like ingredients on a recipe. Mm -hmm. uh, so what blends well together into our process to make an intermediate product that's optimized for another step and another step. So I feel a little bit like uh, what an archeologist might feel like out here sometimes, because mm -hmm. you'll be driving around and check out a bin and it's like, oh, there's a Motorola StarTag phone from the, yeah. the mid nineties that <laughs> made its way here. Redwood Materials is America's largest battery recycler. And last year they recouped enough minerals to produce over 20 gigawatt hours of lithium ion batteries. That's enough to power over 250,000 EVs. Now I looked this up, Americans throw away around 150 million cell phones every year. But did you know just a fraction of those, 160 of them provide enough cobalt to build one of those? Redwoods teamed up with companies like waste management, cell manufacturers, even some of the biggest car manufacturers and consumer electronic makers to make sure that these valuable materials stay in a closed loop. Now you don't see Tesla on the list, but their partnership with Panasonic ensures that most of their batteries end up in Nevada too. Now here's the elephant in the room. For most people, the perception of anything that's been recycled is that it's not as good as the original form, that it's a weaker or degraded version of the original battery. That's actually not the case when it comes to recycled battery cells. I learned that they're just as good or in some ways even better than virgin mine minerals. What we do is we contract directly with the battery cell manufacturers uh, to make their blend to their ultra precise specifications on lines that are dedicated to making just their blend qualified is what it's called in our cathode plant and so there'll be potentially two lines per plant there's room on this pad for five of these buildings it's a really persnickety process to qualify the product and the process for each customer it's not as simple as you know hey panasonic here's a here's a batch Test it, mm -hmm. it's yours if you want it. It's like, this line is gonna be, the every machine, every tool, every piece of it has to be gone over with a fine tooth comb to say, okay, it's, it's the process that's worthy and qualified to actually make our cathode. Over the years, the process of removing these minerals from old batteries has also been refined from using extreme heat in the early days to something cleaner and more efficient. Long, long ago, before there was like a great plan, for doing this kind of work. Oftentimes what would be used is a high temperature process, pyro metallurgy, you think like nickel smelting, so thousands of degrees, where they would just throw the whole EV or what, not necessarily EV back then, but the whole battery device in, uh, at very high temperature it would burn off all the plastics and sort of the stuff they're not interested in. And it would uh, be a fairly efficient way of extracting the cobalt and the nickel, which are very valuable. Uh, benefit is, well, you just got made something valuable. Downside is you burned all the graphite, you have a terrible carbon cost, there's other kind of nasty emissions that go along with that, and you lose all the lithium. So you know, like, is it better than throwing it away? Maybe, depends on who you ask. Um, to follow on genre of technology that's often called wet shred, where you take the battery, you submerge it in water, you shred it into wet battery confetti. You've got intermediate you can sell that's often called black mass. What we wanted to do was make a really valuable intermediate that was dry, it didn't have the electrolyte and all that. We want to do it in a way that's not creating terrible environmental harm, making the problem worse, and still lets us create a maximally valuable intermediate product. So we, we came on a technology uh, that's a much lower temperature, but still heat treatment process. It's often called pyrolysis. What I want you to think is Goldilocks zone, right? We want to create an environment in a big electric oven that's hot enough to vaporize all the plastics and electrolytes and binders and adhesives and deactivate the live battery, but not so hot that it burns the graphite um, or loses the lithium along the way. What we do is we create this Goldilocks zone, uh -huh. we push the oxygen out, we use a big electric heating element, push all this live flammable battery material through it, but with no oxygen and the right temperature, instead of burning, yeah. it's roasting. It's roasting. And if for the right amount of time, at this only hundreds, not thousands of degrees, you vaporize off the plastics and binders and the flammable bits, you deactivate the battery, you leave behind the metal and the carbon, and then you can separate those mechanically later using screens and magnets mm -hmm. and... Are chemicals used in this process at all or just heat? So this process, just heat. Mechanical separation, we're using the screens and the magnets and whatnot afterward, does a really good job of separating the battery material, so like your lithium and your cobalt and your nickel, from your not battery, mm -hmm. but still valuable 
material. So think about all the not battery that's yeah. in a battery pack. You've got enclosure housings that are stainless and aluminum, and you've got copper and the wire harnessing and the aluminum and the cooling tubes. We don't need it to make cathode, but it's still valuable enough to sell. If you wanna to get to an intermediate that you can intrinsically link back to cathode, that's where the chemistry comes in. But okay. this does a lot of the work for us for a much lower cost and with the need for much less chemistry. Okay. And then we take that next step and do the okay. hydrometallurgical process. Today. Earlier you asked the question about the chemistry, like where did the, where's the chemical stuff yeah. happen? This is where you start getting into chemistry. You've got this blend that you made of lithium and cobalt and nickel and graphite and all the like valuable bits, but they're all mixed together. How do I separate them from each other enough that I can fix the ratio in a really science, like en highly engineered way to make fresh cathode? Um, and to do that, we use a process it's very similar to what they do in wastewater treatment plants. It's called selective precipitation. Each one of these materials has different physical properties. I can dissolve them all into a solution, kind of like making simple syrup for margaritas or sweet tea or whatever you use simple syrup for. And then I can do a control. Maybe I change the temperature of the solution. Maybe I change the acidity of the solution in a way that only makes the desired for that step metal pop back out as kind of a gritty solid yeah. floating around in the solution. So um, you can do the experiment. I have kids, I do this with them sometime where you, you make sugar water, you sweeten your lemonade, and then you put it in the refrigerator mm -hmm. and that highly concentrated sugar starts popping out the little crystals. Same thing happens with the material. And so the first step, which you'll see a little bit farther down there, is to dissolve that into solution. Then that solution flows into a tank so we can cool it to precipitate some of the material yeah. into a solid. And then we use this guy up here. This is called a filter press plate. Think of that kind of like a fine mesh filter, the cheese cloth, that you're straining all those little crystals out. Once you've got those like kind of black particles strained into a cake, that then falls through the funnel into the super sack. And if you were trying to separate the lithium, then the lithium's in the sack. If you do a different step to separate the cobalt or the nickel or whatever else, then you can have that in its own sack. Now we can sell all this today. Uh, as we get closer and closer to making our cathode, then we're gonna be the customer for all of these. And since it's much okay. more important and much more valuable, it'll be much better for all of us. Now, when it comes to the emissions produced from this process, that's where it gets fascinating. So we had Stanford come out uh, and they did a two year life cycle analysis that compared our process of let's call it urban mining to a more traditional virgin material mining. And the idea was comparing water consumption, energy consumption, and carbon dioxide emissions. How much cleaner is what we're doing than like a traditional mining process. And they looked at everything from the local energy grid mix, so how is electricity produced uh, that gets sent to the site and what's the carbon emissions of that, all of the different processes, all of the different chemistries, the whole emissions profile, the air abatement system and the works. And they found that between those three variables, we're somewhere between 70 and 80% cleaner than mining. And we, there's a pathway to do even better than that over time. So we knew it, but it was really nice to have that validation. Uh, Nature Magazine just published it too, so we've got some scientific bona fides behind that. What's behind me is brand new. It's something that no one's talked about yet that Redwood is doing that nobody else is doing right now. So when an EV battery goes to Redwood, sometimes there's been a recall or an accident and there's still some juice left in that battery. Well, what do you do with it? Do you recycle it or do you actually try to use up what's left of it? Well, this is a retirement plant for those EV batteries where they're able to put them together and squeeze a little more juice out of them to get more energy. Six megawatts of solar, another six megawatts of solar, harder to see from this vantage point going up, and then eight to 900 different battery packs from EVs that are all being wired together right now uh, to then power a data center. Um, this is gonna be, if I'm correct, understand it correctly, the largest microgrid yeah. on the planet. First, you see these little robots driving around? They kind of like the Roomba. Yeah. <laughs> so those, because these solar panels are flat, I, I hesitate to even call them mounted because there isn't a rack. There isn't any steel underneath that's like holding it. It's literally laid flat on graded ground. There's kind of a chamfered, it's almost like a um, cinder block material at an angle on the edge that keeps wind from getting up underneath. And then they all kind of puzzle piece together and hold each other down. So you can have really, really low cost deployed solar, but it's dusty in the desert. So you need little robots to drive around like Roombas and clean off the dust. So they're just starting that. You can see some of the places where they've done a good job. I think that'll be very sad. I want to put some ASMR effect behind that thing and some yoga music and have that drive around. Um, 
two, you can see the battery packs just over here yeah. and there's you know hundreds and hundreds of them. Um, one of the really cool things about this process is that you can have multiple brands of battery pack all working together. And since each battery kind of speaks its own language and has its own specs, its own impedance, its own voltages, you need to have a special, I like to think of it as a universal translator attached to each one that allows a central kind of like orchestra conductor to tune them in real time, right? So you could have maybe some that need to be brought up a little bit and some that need to be tuned down a little bit for them collectively to work together as this big aggregated system. These are all used batteries, right? They were in an right. EV at some point. I don't know for sure uh, if that pack, you know, pack 7B, whatever it is, is gonna last three months or nine months or six years. Uh, but since we already have this back end of all the recycling built in, I know what we can do with it. And since we have this continuous intake, we've built up that part of the business, we know we're getting this new material in, then I can swap in a new battery and keep the customer happy uh, with the right amount of power, the right amount of backup energy at all times. Um, I like to think of it like squeezing all the juice out of an orange before you recycle the peel. As you can see, this is pretty eye-opening stuff, and there's always naysayers out there that point to EVs ending up in landfills and being hazardous, so this is a great video to save and share with them. I got to see firsthand what Redwood is actually doing, and it's not just recycling batteries, they're actually creating a circular economy, and of course, this is huge for the EV space. Also, this video is not sponsored by Redwood. We paid for our own airfare, car, hotel, all the things, but they did grant us access to get to see what most people don't get to see. All right, guys, I hope you enjoy this video and learn something new, and if you feel like I earned it, please subscribe to this channel. It really goes a long way. These videos take a lot of time, effort, and our own expense to be able to make them happen for you. And we'll catch you guys next time. I didn't think this was possible two years ago. Right? Like I just, the rhetoric I'd heard yeah. around this was it's never, it won't make sense. And well, to be able to connect the different devices together to get, like you said, the last little bit of orange juice out of them, yeah, right? have them all speak together, get that energy, makes sense. Yeah. And we happen to have the right people on the team that have this deep expertise in the EV world that can look at this pack and say, no, I, I can just use it as is. I don't need to try to gut it and pull the pieces out and then fabricate like a new type of product out of it. I can just, you know, be comfortable working with it for what it is, which is a very robust, very safe, kind of durable. I mean, it's built to be in a vehicle. This is sort of like light work mm -hmm. for these batteries. Um, I hesitate to call this a, a retirement community for batteries exactly, but there's a lot of value in them still. They just mm -hmm. don't have to work quite as hard, let's say. Uh, and then we still have some a fantastic path of usefulness for them in the back end.